Our speaker today is Todd Boland of St. John's, Newfoundland. He's a research horticulturist at the Memorial University of Newfoundland Botanical Garden in St. John's. Todd has a master's degree in plant ecology. Uh, prior to his current job, he was a teacher at the College of the North Atlantic. He is a prolific writer, speaker, photographer, tour guide, and avid bird watcher. He wanted to see a red cockade woodpecker here in North Carolina, but unfortunately, it was too far away to see it. So, unfortunately. Did you see Carolina chickadee? I did. And great. Mom, Add that to your life list. Right. Great, great. He's the author, he's the author or co-author of 10 books, which include books on ferns, wildflowers, trees, shrubs, his most recent book is called uh, Gardening in Acid Soils. Todd is co-founder of the Newfoundland Wildflower Society. He is chair of the Newfoundland chapter of NARGS, and he is currently the vice president of the North American Rock Garden Society. Todd has a fine article that's coming out in the April uh, spring issue of the Rock Garden Quarterly on heaths and heathers, which I've had a chance to look at early, uh, early version of that. Uh, Todd left home on Wednesday with four feet of snow in his garden. And since he's been here with David, he's had um, fried okra and collards. <laughs> he's here today, he's here today to speak on the topic, spring alpines of the Spanish Pyrenees. So let's give a springtime North Carolina welcome to Todd Boland. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm only three years late. <laughs> um, you know, three years ago today, practically, is when the world shut down. Mm -hmm. And literally, it was a week out that I was supposed to come down. I was starting to feel some trepidation because slowly things were shutting down, shutting down, shutting down. And thankfully, the Canadian government said, no more traveling outside of Canada. I was like, phew, you know, it was, like, it was a huge relief um, in that regard, but still very disappointing because I was so looking forward to getting to this part of the world. And I didn't think it was going to happen. I figured, okay, that's it. That opportunity was gone. It was not, never going to happen. Um, and I was delighted then like about a year ago when Sydney contacted me and said, oh, we're, we're starting this up again. I was like, woohoo, excellent. Because this is a part of the uh, United States I've never been to. Um, I've spoken several times in the New England states um, I've spoken to Great Lakes chapters, and um, but I've never spoken to this part of the world. And the timing, of course, is great because, as Bobby mentioned, we're in the middle of winter. It's still very wintry back home uh, with, like I said, three to four feet of snow throughout my garden. I actually changed my flight to arrive a day early here because another snowstorm was coming into play uh, and flights were indeed shut down. And when we have our flights shut down, it could take us two to three days to get rebooked. Had that happened, I would not be here. So I took it upon myself to book the flight a day early and everything worked out wonderful. All right, so this morning, am I getting my thing here? I'm gonna share you, with you a trip that I took about 10 years ago uh, to the Pyrenees. And more recently, I've been doing trips that are actually botanical in nature. But back, my other life, as Bobby mentioned, is bird watching. So a lot of my earlier trips that I've taken have been specifically to look at birds in different parts of the world. Um, and most of those areas are usually tropical. You know, all the good birds are down in Brazil or they're in, in Costa Rica or, you know, Colombia, places like that. But um, as it turned out, the company that I went with, which is now defunct, the gentleman um, has since re retired and so he's no longer doing tours. Uh, this was an in-country um, tour company and they do both bird tours in May when I was there, the first, first 10 days or so of May. And then later on in the early part of June, they actually do botanical tours. So the gentleman sent out like a questionnaire to the birders, you know, what do you hope to see on this particular trip? And of course, most people want to see the bearded vulture, which is an endangered species. Um, and when he asked me about my wanting to see, I said, I want to see orchids. <laughs> and he said, uh, you do realize you signed up for the wrong tour. <laughs> But anyway, that was fine. Uh, as it turned out, they had a very early spring and all the orchids were in bloom. So you're going to have the opportunity to uh, share in some of the wonderful things that I saw when I was there. So I've organized this, this presentation. Basically, we're going to increase in elevation. And what we're going to start off with is what we're seeing here in the image here was what we call the pre-Pyrenees. 
So sort of the foothills, we'll say, of the Pyrenees proper. This area um, are sort of zone seven, zone six. Okay, so there may be some of the plants that I'm going to be showing from this region, which would work here. Then, of course, as I get higher and higher in elevation, we're going to be getting into plants that are just the things of dreams for, for you. Um, more realistic for me, but even some of the plants are, are, are the stuff of dreams for me, too. Um, Newfoundland has got a very wet climate. It's got a very long winter, not necessarily cold, cold from your perspective, but, you know, from a, from a world or a Canadian perspective, our winters are not particularly cold. Most, win you know, if it drops down like to 10 degrees, that's really cold. We consider that being a really cold night if it gets down to 10. Most days are usually hovering around the upper 20s, even the low 30s, okay? So uh, it's not too bad, but it's just that it extends into May <laughs> before we get spring. So I was saying to David that your stage right here now at this time of the year is sort of early June back in Newfoundland. So I'll get to have two springs this year, probably three springs, I'm going to England as well in between there. So we'll start off with the pre-Pyrenees. All right, and well, actually I'll start off with showing a map <laughs> first. That always helps. Um, so if I can get my little pointer to work, here we go. Okay, so for, uh, Spain is sort of broken up into a number of different provinces or states. And the area here in pink is the province or the state of Aragon. So, I mean, I could have just call this, you know, the Alpines of, um, you know, the Pyrenees and just leave it at that. I decided to actually specify uh, the province that we were in. But essentially, there's only three provinces that fall within the Pyrenees range. So you're either going to be in the Barcelona area and that in that particular province, uh, the Huesca area, which is the Aragon, or Navarra, which is uh, on the upper section. Essentially, a lot of plant material is the same throughout at any rate. Um, there's a few plants that are more specific to the central area of the Pyrenees as opposed to the more uh, fringe areas in the, coastal, in the coastal regions. So we flew originally into uh, Barcelona and we drove then to Huesca um, and we stayed into a little town uh, just outside of Huesca. And essentially, when we're birding, we did a little bit of birding around Huesca itself, which is sort of desert, semi-desert, sort of step area. And then we went up to Haka, up in this area here, uh, went over to Hecto, over here, and then we traveled backwards uh, to Bielsa, over in this area right here. Um, and in Bielsa is where we actually crossed the border into France. So that's when we actually topped the top of the Pyrenees. So these are the specific areas I'm going to talk about. We're going to start off with the uh, San Cruz de los Cerros area first, which is sort of in the pre-Pyrenees. Then we went to Ceresa, uh, Garbadito, Lizara, and then the Piedra de San Martin is the French border at the highest elevation. So starting off in the pre-Pyrenees, this area was very rocky, very dry um, in this particular spot. And as you were walking along, you were basically walking on carpets of Thymus vulgaris. So it was absolutely wonderful fragrance as you were walking by um, from the, all the plants that are there. Lots of Helianthemum species um, in the Pyrenees. And the ones at the lowest elevation was Apenninum. And then as we got higher in elevation, we started to get into the yellow flowered species, which are probably the more common ones that we grow, say, in New England and, and, and points further north. Uh, Helianthemum numularium. So that's the, the common rock rose that a lot of gardeners grow. I'm not sure how many of you are growing that one here or how well that one does here. I would have thought it would do okay um, in this part of the world. We have a little bit of trouble with that one. It has a tendency to brown off sometimes in the winter if we have a cold snap uh, with very little snow cover. And that's been hybridized and selected over the years now. So there's a whole rainbow of colors. You can get this in uh, white, yellows, oranges, reds, pinks. So there's a lot to choose from. But the wild version is this nice bright yellow. Uh, Coronella species. There were several of these um, very little sort of low legume relatives, a very spiny foliage. I just cannot grow them at all in my part of the world. Uh, we're just way, way, way too wet uh, to keep them happy.
a number of different convolvular species that did a little morning glories. Um, again, I can't grow these. We're just too wet to where I'm too. I would think that would you would have a better chance uh, growing those down here. So Convolvius lineatus is probably one of the prettier ones. Okay, so that was just sort of, those are sort of plants that were growing around the little bed and breakfast where we stayed at um, um, near Huesca. So we end up then going up into these mountains here, which is the Pre-Pyrenees area, the Vadiello Valley. And again, specifically, we went there to see the bearded vultures because they, there's two or three pairs that breed on the cliffs there. Should note that this is all limestone and typical limestone seems to be the place to find all the alpines. It seems like most of the interesting plants always grow on lime. So here's the valley. This has been dammed off. There used to be quite a large river that flowed into this area, but uh, behind me would be the actual reservoir. That's there, and this is part of the reservoir. And you can see how all the limestone in this area has all been very weathered into all these like little hollows. Okay, so almost a karst-like topography um, to the areas that were here. And we did see the bearded vultures flying around the cliffs there. But as we once we got up here and we sort of got into the parking lot and we stepped out, I was not interested in um, seeing the bearded vultures because there was something else there that really caught my eye immediately. And no, it wasn't these cliffs, but they were pretty picturesque, don't get me wrong. Absolutely beautiful. This is what drove me to distraction when I was there. I was not interested in seeing bearded vultures when I was seeing two Pyrenean endemics growing right in the parking lot with the Ramunda and the Saxifraga longifolias. Um, it was absolutely stunning to see these growing on vertical cliffs. And what's great about when you go on these kind of trips and you see plants that you grow in your own gardens and see how they grow in the wild, you realize that's what I'm doing wrong. Okay, so you realize that, oh my gosh, that's, this wants to grow this way or that way or whatever, and I'm growing it in an absolutely, completely incorrect way of growing these things. So it was fantastic to see these two plants just growing side by side. So the Ramundas were growing on these vertical cliff faces on limestone. Newfoundland is all acidic, hence I wrote the book on gardening on acidic soils based on my experiences and plus Jamie Ellison, who's a co-author who lives in Nova Scotia. Um, any of you who are going to the Nova Scotia meeting will get to meet Jamie there. Um, we're both dealing with acid soil conditions, yet we both grow Ramunda uh, Maconi. It's surprisingly hardy. And this is an African violet relative. Um, I never dreamt that it would be it would survive in Newfoundland, and I know people who are even in colder zones than myself that are having great success with growing this particular plant. On a closer view of their flowers, is absolutely exquisite plant, and if you don't have it, fuss it, fuss over it to grow it because you you really want to have this plant. But Saxifraga longifolia was another spectacular plant, and unlike most saxifrages, this is a monocarpic species. So it just grows and grows and the rosette keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And literally when the rosettes are like almost the size of a, of a I call it a Nerf football, <laughs> okay? Um, and for the older people, we'll know what a Nerf football is. So um, when they get, you know, when the heads are like this big on the rosette, then it'll flower. And it'll produce this mag magnificent spray of white flowers, like a fountain effect. Because again, they're growing on these vertical cliffs. Um, and then the plant dies. It produces thousands of seeds, and no doubt a lot of these seeds are falling into the parking lot, never get a chance to germinate. But obviously enough seeds do make it onto the cliff faces to keep the plants going. So we were seeing plants at all stages, from little tiny rosettes to great big rosettes, to the flowering plants. Okay, and it's probably by far the most spectacular saxifrage of all the species. And there's, I don't know how many, there's probably a hundred plus species of saxifrages in the world. Um, but this particular one is definitely, it's not the only monocarpic one, don't get me wrong. There are several others as well, but certainly amongst um, all the saxifrages is by far the most spectacular. I mean, you almost hate to have it bloom for you. <clears throat> and I've grown it in my garden and I've gotten it to bloom in my garden and I, it didn't set any seed for me. So I managed to get seeds from another seed exchange and I'm starting it over again. And um, as was mentioned, next year at this time would be Paul Spriggs. And Paul Spriggs, we invited him to our botanic garden last May, and he put in a new crevice garden for us, which is my pride and joy, because uh, I got to work side by side with Paul. 
And I do have several Saxifraga longifolias now in that um, crevice garden, and it's a limestone crevice garden. So I'm hoping that the saxifrage will be very, very happy there. Anyway, we, this is part of the world has a number of bulbs as well. And it was interesting to see Allium Molly growing there because I grow this in my own garden. You know, it's a standard plant in the industry. Uh, but again, seeing them growing in the wild in very, very rocky uh, soil. I mean, there's hardly any soil here. It's basically just sort of gravel. Uh, Gladiolus Illyricus, that's got a fairly wide distribution. It's a, a reasonably hardy Gladiolus. I say reasonably, not quite, it's sort of borderline in the land uh, for where it could grow. I'm, I would think it would best be the best kind here. Uh, Brimura ameth amethystina, it used to be a, a hyacinth, but it's all been re everything's been reclassified now amongst the bulbs. So um, it's very scylla-like um, as far as bulbs grow. We can grow this one back in Newfoundland as well. Um, Aphelanthes monspeliensis, I've, I've never had any luck growing that one. I think that one is definitely not hardy at all. Uh, again, probably would be perfectly fine around here. Is there anyone growing this? Yeah. Yes, okay, well, there you go. And you're having success with it, Tony? Excellent. Right on, I, I figured it seemed like it would be a kind of plant that would be happy around here. Some of the cliff dwellers, these are sort of natural crevice plants. Obviously, the Ramunda and the, and the Saxifrage were growing in crevices as well. Uh, Valeriana montana, not a floral knockout, but super fragrant. You'd smell this plant long before you see it. It's amazing. Such a small little plant could be so fragrant. Uh, Acerina procumbens, a sort of a snapdragon type relative. Uh, Sedum dazophyllum. And you can see here, like I said, they're literally just growing these little tiny crevices. So it gives you sort of great inspiration if you're putting in a crevice garden, what are some of the plant material that you can grow there? Uh, Lithodora diffusa. I've tried this one. It, it just keeps burning off on me every winter. Some people have luck with it. But, you know, a lot of these little alpines, as you well know, you need to get down there. And if you have a little magnifying glass, you can really start to see some of the really subtle um, intricacies of the blossoms. And most people probably never realize that Lithodora has this really hairy um, down into the, uh, into the tube of the flower. And, of course, it's all about the pollinators. So the pollinator is down there poking his nose, or his tongue, I should say, into that. You know, and he's picking up the pollen and then brushing that pollen then against all these, these hairs and dropping the pollen back down through the stigmatic surfaces. And I mean, nature is absolutely wonderful. Uh, Euphorbia uh, terraceus, we can't grow that. Um, I have seen that growing in gardens around here, so you obviously can do it. So from there, now we're heading up into the mountains proper. Um, so we're go we spent a couple of days in Santa Cruz de los Cerros um, at about 1,400 meters. I would say this is probably, again, around a zone six in this particular area. They get a little bit of snow in winter, but it doesn't stick around for very long. And, you know, typical in Spain, every little community has this great big, huge church, uh, which is basically the center of life. Uh, they're, they're all Roman Catholic in this particular area. So you'll see all these beautiful, beautiful monasteries um, scattered um, throughout all the various little towns that are there. And very old, of course. I mean, you, everything in Europe is anciently old. And this area, of course, in Spain was not involved in the, in the World Wars. So a lot of the old original buildings are hundreds of years old and were never um, uh, damaged in any way, shape, or form during the various wars. So this area was basically uh, mostly woodland. And it was a combination of European beech forest, um, some um, species of pine and some spe species of fir that were growing in this area. And this is the view. So you sort of walk through the forest and then you broke out just spectacular vista. And in the background here, you can see sort of in the clouds, the snow-capped Pyrenees proper. Okay, so we're sort of at the peak, I suppose, of the pre-Pyrenees. And we end up driving down through this pastoral valley and then we actually start to ascend then into the proper Pyrenees in itself. And here's a sort of a, a zoom in um, of the snow-capped mountains of the Pyrenees. Okay, so we, again, lots of bulbous plants in this area because it would get quite dry here for many, many months of the summer months, okay? Um, early May, it's spring, and this is when all the bulbs were blooming. So Asphodelus albus, we were seeing there, and Asphodelus cerasifiris, which got this beautiful blue foliage. 
but otherwise the flowers are quite similar between the two. And I can't grow these at all. We had one species of Narcissus, Narcissus asuanus. And I'm not sure, Tony, you might know the answer to that one. Is that one of the parents in like the baby moon and, and, and all that group? Don't know, okay. Because the foliage is very similar and the flowers are somewhat similar. Because I mean, I'm seeing them in gardens around here with these little small multi-flowered uh, narcissus with very terrete foliage. Muscari neglecta, we're all over the place. They're basically roadside weeds. Um, some fritillarias, Fritillaria pyrenaica. So it's a, an ende one of the endemic uh, fritillarias. And it's amazing the number of endemic plants that we did see in the Pyrenees. I suppose because the Pyrenees are somewhat separated from the Alps proper, and whereas the Alps are a little bit closer to the Carpathians and those other mountains further to the east, when you get into the Alps, you'll find species of plants that have very wide distributional range. Whereas within the Pyrenees, a lot of the Alpines have just never spread beyond the Pyrenees. So they just stay, stay very localized and hence become a, uh, an endemic. This is a weird little bulb, uh, Dipcadi serotinum. And it's got these, just these little sort of straw brown colored little bell-like flowers, uh, not a floral knockout. But what was interesting is that it was growing in these beds of moss, which is not at all where I would expect to see a bulb growing. Some in the sunny meadows, the open slopes. These are more, you know, sort of step type plants, I suppose, in some way, shape, or form. I don't know about call them necessarily true alpines. Um, the Linum narbonense, the blue flax, and that does have a very wide distributional range throughout Europe. Uh, Ranunculus gramineus, and we have that in our garden, and it just sort of self-seeds all over the place. So it was pretty cool to see it actually growing in the wild. And, you know, we think about buttercups as being like nasty garden weeds, but there's a lot of very, very exquisite and very choice uh, buttercups in the world. Um, for those of us that were on the Swiss tour that Narix did last year, we saw some absolute beauties, uh, white flowered buttercups, which were absolutely gorgeous. But we didn't see, well, we did see a couple of white ones. I'll show you that a little bit later. So Geranium pyrenaicum, very, very ubiquitous little plant growing on the edges of the woodlands. And I grow that one in my garden, it self seeds all over my garden. So it's a pretty tough little plant. Um, another valerian, I never was able to find out what species. Valeriana spill. But very fragrant, as most valerians are. Um, Eryngium borgatii, so it's one to see hollies. We had trouble growing that one. Uh, I think that one needs a little bit drier than what we are in Newfoundland. I should note that we have about 60 inches of rain a year. Uh, Josiani Montana. And that's a relative of, of, of bellflowers, although you never say it. Uh, Anthillus Montana, a little pea relative. Saponaria osamoides, soapwort. And that's a very ubiquitous plant in the nursery industry. It was interesting, the flower shape on their soapwort, so we're a little bit different from the standard ones we see around here. Growing in just gravel. I mean, basically just sort of scree slopes is where they were growing. Um, in the woodlands, we were seeing hepaticas. So they're, they're the European version of the hepatica um, americanas that grow here. Anemone ranunculoides, so it's a yellow flowered um, anemone. You'd think it was a buttercup, um, and hence the name ranunculoides basically means it's the anemone that looks like a buttercup. Um, Allium ursinum, one of the uh, little woodland um, ornamental onions, if you want to call it that, and that's an edible plant. So it tastes and smells very much like garlic. It's like a wild garlic. Now, we saw the first of the orchids, uh, Anacamptus morio, was very, very common. That was, we kept coming across that plant from the lowland areas right up into the tops of the mountains. Um, vibrant, vibrant fuchsia color. Uh, Anacamptus pyramidalis, some were pale pink, some were deeper pink. 
And most of these orchids are really not being grown in cultivation in our parts of the world. Although I've been seeing some pictures on, on Facebook of some of the people in the UK that are actually growing these as garden plants. Uh, Orchis militaris. I mean, they're absolutely spectacular if you could grow them. I mean, the colors are just incredible. Um, and a number of bee orchids. This is Ophrys sphagoides. And with these uh, bee orchids, essentially the lip of the flower right here is mimicking the female of a solitary bee. And the timing is all critical because what happens, the male bees emerge first before the females. And they're, I, I, I'm not gonna be delicate, they're as horny as a goat, okay, when they come out. And they'll mate with anything that looks like a female. And this is where the orchids come into play. So the orchids have to have their blooming to coincide with just after the males come out, but before the females come out. Because once the females come out, the males are not going to bother with the flower anymore. Not when you got the real, you got the real thing. <laughs> okay. So in order for this orchid to be pollinated, it's all about the timing. All right. So it's absolutely fascinating how all these various bee orchids end up getting pollinated. Uh, this is probably the more spectacular of the bee orchids, Ophrys uh, scolopax. And you can even see how on the flower, you even have the antennae that looks like the female. Okay. Um, and a lot of these orchids would also produce a fragrance that's like the pheromone released by the female bee, All right? So it's just that one step. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing what has evolved over the years, this relationship between orchids and insects, all right? So in this case, very specific. You got probably only one or two species of bee that is the primary or the solid only pollinator of this particular orchid. So if the bee dies out, the orchid is going to die out. Okay, that's just how interconnected they are. Okay, so we left from there. We went across that lovely valley. Now we're going to go up into the Pyrenees proper. And we spent a couple of days in this lovely little town called Ceresa. So we're at about 1,300 meters now. So we've actually dropped down uh, 100 meters uh, from the previous location. Again, beautiful monasteries. The architecture of these buildings are spectacular. You know, it was, it was lovely in the afternoon just sort of to walk around the town, spend our mornings bird watching or botanizing, uh, depending on what you want to do. But just very quiet. I mean, you hardly, you might, you might bump into one or two people. Uh, it was just a very, very quiet little place. So here now we start to get into some of the ferns. Um, Cystopterus fragilis, very wide distributional range, occurs throughout the whole Arctic. So right across Eura northern Eurasia and right across North America. Um, Asplenium ceterac, which is the broader-leaved fern right here. Um, and then Asplenium viridi, which is the finer one on the, uh, on the left there. And again, just sort of a whole sh uh, smorgasbord of different types of ferns growing together. So in the fields, we were seeing Arnica montana. Um, that's sort of a medicinal plant. You often see, you know, different types of medicinal herbs. Uh, you'll see Arnica being sold. I'm not sure what it does for you, uh, but it is in supplements. And this has got a wide distributional range. We saw these in the, in the uh, Alps as well. Um, along the stream sides, Caltha palustris, marsh marigold. And every place I've been in the northern hemisphere, whether it's been a botanical trip or whether it's been a birding trip, I always stumble into Caltha palustris. It's common in Newfoundland. It's common across Europe. It's common in the Pacific, in the Pacific Northwest. Um, it's absolutely amazing. So it's sort of my little uh, friend, I suppose, botanically speaking, when I'm traveling around. It sort of keeps you grounded uh, to see the marsh marigolds. I found the ones in the Pyrenees that were much more orangey than ours. Ours in, in Newfoundland are quite bright yellow, but these ones were really um, uh, quite an orangey yellow. Okay, um, Cardamine raphanifolia. It's um, grow, it was sort of growing along the edges of the streams in quite wet little locations. I think, I'm not sure if these have been reclassified as a dentaria or the dentarias are only in North America and the ones in Europe are still Cardamine. Uh, Pinguicula grandiflora, it's a butterwort. So this is an insectivorous plant. So those leaves, if you touch them, they almost feel somewhat slimy and little flies that will come by and be attracted to those leaves will get stuck to the leaves and form a nice supplement. More orchids, another bee orchid, Ophrys lutea, the yellow bee orchid. 
Um, Cephalanthera longifolia is called the white helleborine orchid. And we had the pink helleborine or the red helleborine orchid, Cephalanthera rubra. Um, Aceris anthropophorum. This is called the man orchid. And the flowers are typically green, but sometimes they can be red. And Orchis purpurea was the lady orchid because she has a much more fancy sort of Spanish dancer type lip. Absolutely stunning, those flowers. I mean, the, the part of the flower is almost black purple. It's so dark. Um, Orchis choreophora. And of course, I did my, um, as, as Bobby mentioned, I'm really a plant ecologist. I have a master in plant ecology. But my undergraduate degree and my master's degree was on orchids. So this is why I have a soft spot for any anytime I, I come across orchids. So anyway, we continue from there and we start going a higher up in elevation. And this used to be a monastery. Um, but now it's been converted into a cafe, which is sort of a popular thing to do these days. So this is the Garbadito. So we stopped in there and we had a nice little latte or ca a cappuccino before we decided to go out there for a walk up through the forest there. Um, lots of cattle in this area. We went up through this little ravine up through here, all limestone cliffs again. We were there looking for a bird called a wall creeper. And it's a little small little bird that basically feeds almost like a nuthatch, but they, they cling, cling up to the sides of the mountain uh, slopes. It's a gray bird, very nondescript against a gray rock. But when it flies, its wings are fuchsia pink. And you get this flashes of pink. And then when it lands on the cliffs and it closes wings, it just goes back gray, the same color as the rock. So it was absolutely amazing. Like these flashes. And we were sitting with our binoculars looking, looking, looking for that little flash to take place. But of course, I was being distracted by other things. So as we're walking up to that ravine, we started to come across some of the hellebores. So hellebores viridis, the green hellebore. And we were too late. It was already late in the season for the hellebores um, phoeticus. So they were already going well into their seed pods at that stage. And I've seen them around here. Now, this is the stuff of dreams. I've been trying to get my hands on this. I keep getting seeds, but they're very ephemeral, and the seeds never germinate for me. Uh, this is Paris quadrifolia. So it's, Europe, it's Europe's answer to a trillium. All right? So our trilliums are all in parts of three. Their Paris are in parts of four. All right? Um, and they're not particularly showy, okay? So that the, uh, the petals are quite green and quite narrow, not big flamboyant petals like you see on our North American trilliums for the most part. But still a very, very choice, very, very special plant. Even if it's only green, it's still spectacular and I want it. <laughs> uh, Primula virus, everywhere, ubiquitous, okay? So that's probably the most common uh, Primula you see in sort of the low-lying areas, usually growing in quite damp meadows. Um, and then the oxlip, the Primula elatiers, they were growing side by side as well. Uh, the little silvery leaves you see on the bottom there, that's um, Alcamilla alpina, the alpine lady's mantle. We didn't see that in bloom, but we saw their leaves here and there. Um, another saxifrage now. So we saw Saxifraga granulata, quite different from the regular saxifrage. It's actually quite leafy. It's a little leafy little plant. They sometimes call it the fair maids of France. Um, Cardamine heterophylla. Lovely woodland plant. I, I've tried this from seed and I've never gotten the seeds to germinate. Beautiful plant, close up, very uh, almost silky-like texture to the blossoms. Uh, a bulb that I've never seen in cultivation, Scylla lilio hyacinthus. Quite large, it's probably the largest Scylla um, that I've seen as far as Scylla's I've seen in, North, in, um, in parts of Europe. And it's quite attractive, but yet I've never seen it in cultivation. Tony, have you ever come across this one? I, so I don't know why, why there, someone has not introduced this, because I think it's a, it's a lovely plant. Uh, Pinguicula alpina. So this is the alpine butterwort. So the other one, we saw the grandiflora, big purple flowers. Now we're getting ones with little white flowers, just a little yellow markings on the lip. Another insectivorous plant. More orchids, Orchis provincialis, bright yellow lip. Um, or sometimes the lips can be just uh, paler yellow. Okay, so we left from there. Now we're going higher up again. 
Uh, we're en route to the French border, a uh, place called Lazara. Lots of uh, cattle being kept in these sort of alpine, subalpine meadows. And I think the cattle are actually helping the plants because they're keeping all the shrubs at bay, which are then allowing the more alpine type plants to keep on growing. And we did a lovely walk, vibrant green, the trees up the hillsides that were just starting to leaf out, sort of maybe like a, a two weeks advanced from what we are right here now at this time of the year. But this, like I said, this would have been around the early part of May. Um, Androsaceae villosa, absolutely <laughs> choice, choice. We're starting to come into the really choice alpines, stuff that are probably more challenging for you to grow down here. And the androsaceae also has a very interesting scenario, and most androsaceae do this, is that when the flowers are unpollinated, the center is yellow, and after they've been pollinated, it turns pink. And that's basically, they let the pollinators know, you this flower, you don't have to worry about this one. Ignore this one, go to the ones that are yellow instead. Uh, Lotus alpinus, another little pea relative. Hornugia alpina. It's a, um, in the, the um, Brassicaceae family. It's a cruciferous plant. So it's sort of related to the Arabis. You look at it and you think it was a rock cress to look at it. But the foliage is completely different from a regular rock cress. Um, another rock cress relative is Iberis spathulata. And it's the Iberis is not these big leaves. The Iberis are these much smaller leaves in the center. Linaria alpina is a rather short-lived little plant. Um, you know, you get two or three years out and then the plant dies. We have it growing in our botanic garden, but it just sort of self-seeds around and keeps itself going. And they can be deep purple or they can be just pale or purple. This was exquisite when I came across this. I only saw the one plant. And it was just at the peak of perfection, uh, Vitaliana primula flora, which is now actually an androsaceae. It's been reclassified um, now. But you can just see the way this plant wants to grow. It wants to just grow in a little limestone pocket. That's where it's happiest. Uh, Globularia repens, a very broad distribution. We saw those in the Alps as well when we were there. Cerastium cerastoides is a little chickweed with very glossy foliage. A lot of the chickweeds have much grayer foliage, somewhat hairy, uh, but this one here had a very, very smooth, glossy foliage. Veronica fruticans, lovely little blue thing. Uh, Anemone narcissiflora. Uh, I, I imagine you probably cannot grow that one here. It's, it's one of the anemones that prefers cooler temperatures. Um, but you can see how it gets the name Narcissa flora because the, the flowers from a distance you'd almost think was like a Tizetta daffodil. Now we're getting into the real stuff, okay? The real stuff, the gentians, oh my God. So this is why you go to the mountains in Europe. All right, whether it's the Pyrenees, whether it's the Alps, the Carpathians, because um, every one of the mountains, high mountain areas uh, throughout Europe have these wonderful trumpet gentians. Now there's a number of different species, around seven or eight different species. They all look very, very similar. Different, different shades of blue essentially. Um, <clears throat> but some grow on limestone and some grow on acidic. Strangely enough, gentian alpina is actually an acid lover. Right, so not all of the Pyrenees are limestone, a lot of it is, but there are pockets that are more acidic. Um, and when we were getting into these acidic areas, we were actually coming across some ericas as well, wild ericas that were growing to heather, uh, heaths that were growing there. But anyway, gentian alpina, absolutely gorgeous. Oh my God, I mean, that blue is just knock your socks off. And I don't know what it is about blue alpines or blue flowers in general, because it's interesting, because I have an Instagram account and every time I post a blue flower, it's amazing the number of likes you get compared to if I post like a yellow flower or a white flower. So it seems like, you know, as humans, we're just fascinated by blue when it comes to a flower. And another relative, also in brilliant blue, it's the gentians, is gentiana verna. Um, I have a tough time with this one, but all the gentiana vernas I've seen in the wild have always been growing 
cheek by jowl with other plants around them. They've never been growing by themselves. And in the past, when I've grown gentiana verna, I've always like planted it, its, its own little, little niche where I planted it, and every spring it was dead. So I think it's one of these plants. You want to snug it, snuggle it up next to another alpine to keep it happy. Um, lately now, I'm getting a little bit better luck with it only because I'm growing it now in a trough. An alpine trough, I can sneak it up next to other plants and it seems to be quite happy. But in the open rock garden, I have had no luck with this plant at all. Um, Helianthemum um, alpestri, sort of the alpine version of Numularium with much smaller flowers. This is a weird plant, Timelia tinctoria. It's a relative of Daphne. Okay, so it's a Daphne, so quite fragrant. Uh, we yellow flowers, and all the flowers are just sort of uh, axillary in between the leaves. I look at this forever before I realize that it was actually a, a, a relative of Daphne. And there was Daphne there as well, Daphne l'oreola. Again, another one with sort of yellowy green flowers. Not much to get excited over. I think this one's an invasive species in the Pacific Northwest. More orchids, Dactylorhiza sambucina. And the flowers of sambucina could be yellow or they could be purple. And it's hard to believe this is the same species. And yet you never, if they hybridize, they either go back to purple or they go to yellow. You never saw any that were halfways between a yellow and a purple, and you think you would. But every plant was either, this is a yellow plant, this is a purple plant, and never the two shall cross. Go figure. I, I thought for sure there were two separate species, but no, all the literature says, nope, they're all the one species. Obviously, the purple one is just stunning. That color is just so vibrant. Uh, Platanthera bifolia. Now, we have a lot of Platantheras here in North America, and you have several growing here in the state. Um, <clears throat> In Europe, they only have two species. So really the, the center of origin for Platantheras is North America. Orcus mascula, another stunning plant. And you can see just how it grows in these little uh, subalpine grassy meadows. So now we're going up, we're getting towards the end. Uh, we're heading right up now to uh, 2,400 meters, close to the French border. We're starting to come across patches of late lying snow. And as alpine enthusiasts, you make a beeline to these little snow, late snow beds because that's where all the really choice stuff grows. And again, this area is all limestone, all very, very weathered limestone. And you know, I made a beeline. We were looking for a, a bird called the alpine accentor, which we did see there, um, but I was sort of poking around the edge of the snow melt to see what I could find. So one of the plants you find right at the edges of the melting snow was Pulsatilla vernalis. And literally within a couple of days of the snow melt, their flowers open. And the Pulsatillas, if anyone has grown, even Vulgaris will do it, because I know I've seen some Vulgaris growing here, probably the only one that probably can grow here in the state. Um, <clears throat> their flowers follow the sun. All right, so in the morning, the flowers will be facing to the east, and then by the end of the day, the flowers are all facing to the west. And it's, all, again, all about the pollinator. Because what you see on these flowers, the flowers are sort of like a, a um, almost a bowl shape. And when the sun's rays hit the, the petals, it actually deflects, um, or deflects light and heat into the center of that flower. Of course, which is where all the pollen is, and, and uh, the female and the male bits and pieces. So it actually creates a warmer environment. So the center of that flower is actually several degrees warmer than the ambient temperature around. So if you're a pollinator, and all our little insects are all cold-blooded, they're looking for a nice little warm place to snuggle up into. And if they can get a nice little warm spot in the middle of that flower, and they're just sort of fuddling around, oh, it's like a little bed for me, in the process to bring about pollination. All right, so that's what it's all about. All these wonderful flowers that we're so excited to see blooming in our gardens, you know, and we get great beauty and joy from it. Really, the plants could not care less about us. Their flowers are all about the pollinators, okay? So, uh, you know, just something to think about. It gives you a better appreciation um, all about the intricacies. So we start to come across, at this point, some of the white-flowered buttercups. This is Ranunculus alpestris, the alpine buttercup. And I think once we get into these kind of buttercups, they're very challenging to grow in cultivation. Uh, they have very exacting requirements. 
Uh, Ranunculus Pyrenaeus, a, um, an endemic buttercup. Ranunculus glacialis, an absolutely another stunning one in the really, really high alpine areas. We saw this in Switzerland as well, um, growing just on these limestone scree slopes. In their case for the pollinators, because it's all about the pollinators, when the flowers first open, they're white, and as advertising to the pollinators, come and visit me. But once they get pollinated, the flowers turn pink. And then it's like, don't bother with me. I've already been visited. Go elsewhere. I mean, that's just absolutely stunning. But again, the flowers have that hyperbolic lens type shape. And it's actually heating up a couple of degrees above the ambient temperature in, to, in, uh, in order to create this warmer environment for the little bees that are flying around there. Um, a few more saxifrages, Saxifraga bryoides, a very, very in, um, tight little bun-forming saxifrage. Silenia collis, very ubiquitous plant, grows in Newfoundland, grows in the Canadian Rockies, um, it grows in the Pyrenees, it grows in the Alps, it grows in the Carpathians. Um, it's again, what we call a whole Arctic distribution. So throughout the entire Northern hemisphere um, in the proper uh, Alpine and or Arctic environments. Saxifraga oppositifolia. Oh my God. It is again, another plant that dreams are made out of. Um, it's interesting because this has got a whole Arctic distribution as well. But for some unknown reason, the clones from North America are virtually impossible to grow in cultivation. So if you are purchasing, if you have the opportunity um, to purchase a Saxifraga oppositifolia, chances are it's from a European selection. The European ones are amenable to cultivation. The North American ones are not. I have not been able to figure out why that should be. But just stunning. Um, Erythronium dense canis. Okay, so it's, it's, they don't have a lot of trout lilies in Europe, okay, compared to what we have here in North America. Um, but what they do have is absolutely quite beautiful. So you have these lovely tessellated foliage and these lovely little pink flowers. Um, and then, of course, very quickly the flowers have faded and the whole plant disappears for the season. First of the alpine primroses, Primula hirsuta. And, you know, when you're in these alpine environments and everything is pretty, there's not a lot of color. You know, it's a lot of brown. The snows have just melted. You know, it's lots of bright green. The new grasses are just starting to come up. And all of a sudden you see this flash of pink or this flash of blue or a flash of yellow. And again, as you're a pollinator flying by, you are going to be drawn to that like a bullseye. And of course, as alpine lovers, we're drawn to it as well. Uh, Primula integrifolia. Another, this one, uh, Hirsuta, I see in cultivation. Integrifolia, I've not come across yet. And a closer view. And again, you don't realize until you get really a nice macro shot and you see all those hairs in the very center part of the flower. And a lot of that intricacies, we really don't appreciate until you get down your hands and knees. Narcissus, wild daffodils, okay? And this looks like a regular daffodil. This is Narcissus, pseudo-Narcissus. We're just sort of catching the tail end. You see the blossoms are already starting to go past. Um, interesting, if you take the literal Latin translation of this, it's the daffodil that's a fake daffodil. Okay, it's like it's a pseudo-daffodil. Like why it's just a pseudo-daffodil, I, I have no idea. But anyway, it looks a lot like a classic daffodil, albeit much smaller stature than what we're used to. And this was the pride and joy. Um, and we, uh, we were very fortunate to see this in uh, Switzerland as well. But right along the edges of those melting snow, you get a specialty plant called the soldanellas. They're related to primroses and they typically only grow in these late lying snow bed areas on the, on the fringes of those areas. So you have to be there at the right time. You gotta be there within a week of the snow melt because the flowers don't last for very long and then you just have foliage for the rest of the season. So it's all about the timing. And 
it's fine and dandy. You may, you might say and go in one spot. Say, oh, all the snow is melted here. I'm not going to see the soul Dinellas. But if then around the next turn you're seeing a snow bed, wow, I still have a, a fighting chance of coming across that plant. So the flowers are typically purpley. Uh, sometimes it can be sort of a reddish shade, um, and sometimes it can almost be, be pure white. But very appropriately named, called the fr called the fringe bell. And with that, I say thank you. Okay. Questions, comments. So the question that was asked was, how large are the bee orchids? And the plants themselves are probably around six to eight inches in height, but the individual flowers, maybe a half an inch to an inch. So it, it would match up with the size of whatever the bee is who's gonna be pollinating it. So there's some variation amongst the different species of bee orchids as well. Some may have slightly larger flowers than the other because they're using, utilizing a larger solitary bee. And then those that are utilizing the smaller solitary bees are the ones that would have the smaller blossoms. Yeah. Okay, so the question was asked is, with the Saxifraga longifolia, um, how long do the flowers last? And because it's such a huge spray and we're literally getting hundreds of blossoms on that, it does last for several weeks. So unlike a lot of saxifrage, which is typically, you know, a week or so, if the weather turns hot, then it may only be literally a couple of days uh, before the flowers are finished. The longifolias last much longer. And they were growing in a quite low down. They weren't really in the high elevation areas. It was relatively low elevation and quite hot in that area. Now, they were growing on sort of east and north facing slopes. So they would get shaded in the afternoon. So obviously, they wouldn't be getting the full blast of that afternoon hot sun. So as a result, the flowers would last a little bit longer. Um, but you know, the one that I have in my garden that did bloom, I say the flowers lasted for the better part of maybe about three weeks from, from start to finish. Yeah, okay, so the question was asked, are there companies that um, lead tours um, to the Pyrenees for botanical trips? And the answer is most definitely yes. Because um, I am a, a tour manager with a comp British company called Green Tours. And specifically, I do a tour of the limestone barrens in Newfoundland. But they do do tours, and I think they might actually have two different areas um, in the Pyrenees that they go to on various tours. I suspect that Brightwater probably goes there as well. Um, I, I would imagine that if you just do a Google search, you will find that indeed, because it is a really special area. It's easy to get around, it's easy access to the really uh, choice plants. So there's no reason in the world why um, they wouldn't be doing tours. Now there's another area in Spain, on the, on the northern end of Spain, it's like, it's like a separate mountain range. Um, and I'm trying to remember the name. Picos. Yes, that's it, the Picos. Um, and there's tours in that area, because there's a number of endemic plants in that area as well that occur there that don't occur in the Pyrenees proper. So, you know, either one of those, that could be two separate tours at some point in the future. Um, and as I'm now sort of the, the tours thing is sort of falling on my shoulders, <laughs> as it turns out. So uh, I'm interested in, I would love to get back there again, because it's been at least 10 years since I've been there. And uh, it'd be nice to do a botanical trip as opposed to a birding trip because I was just sort of snapping the pictures as I was looking at birds. So it was hard on the neck and hard on the back, up and down, up and down all the time. So it'd be nice just to stay down. <laughs> just crawl around on my hands and knees for, for a week. Um, so yeah, so that's, in th you know, thank you for that uh, suggestion. And um, it'll definitely be considered. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, I've never come across one that was specific to that area. We were using a, uh, a guide, which was the Alpine Flowers of Europe. Um, oh, I'm trying to remember the gentleman now who wrote, who wrote the book. He's written so many books. But um, he's from England, anyway, the gentleman who wrote it. And uh, that, was our, that was our guide, and it's the same guide that we use in Switzerland as well. Um, and essentially, that book covers the Pyrenees, the Alps, and, the Car and goes as far as the Carpathians. I uh, don't think that book is as good once you get to the Caucasus. So you're sort of, because by the time you get to the Caucasus, which is basically uh, the country of Georgia and um, Albania, not Albania, no. Uh, Armenia? Uh, yes, thank you. I knew it was an A. <laughs> right, right church, wrong pew. Um, 
for that area, then once you get into that area, that particular guide is not so good. But I think there is a brand new guide that has just come out now for Albania or for um, Armenia. Armenia, sorry, um, which will cover the, 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 the alpine plants from the uh, from the Caucasus region. But yeah, so there's no, I never saw, they, they may exist, but I, I never came across a specific book for that area. Um, I would suspect that those that I saw in the lower elevation area, so the question is asked, could, could any of these orchids be grown um, in this part of the world? And in the pre-Pyrenees area, so the first orchids we came across, they would be areas that would get very hot and dry in the summer. Now, I know you get most of your rain actually in the summer, so it may be a bit problematic because they probably would rot uh, when they're dormant, because a lot of these orchids would actually go completely disappear. They're ephemerals. So they would go completely dormant by the time June or July rolled around and wouldn't poke their noses up anymore until probably midwinter, because for them in that area by end of February, early March, just if there is any snow, it's gone. And those orchids start to come up quite, quite early. So I know that in Europe, they're growing some of them, but they're growing them in alpine houses. So they can be really, they can really, you know, basically keep them bone dry in the winter. Um, yeah, or in the summer, sorry. Um, so I would say it'd be very challenging. I would say it'd be challenging. Oh my God. I've certainly killed more plants than I've, than I've kept alive. Um, and, you know, and that goes with the territory because I'm always trying to push the envelope. And whether it's for my own garden or more, more in particular from the botanical garden perspective, because we get seeds from um, seed exchanges from other botanical gardens throughout, well, primarily Europe. And so I'm, I'm sowing between two and 300 pots of seeds every year um, of things which I know most of them will probably never grow <laughs> or never survive in Newfoundland. But I've been surprised. I've come across things that's like, wow, this is actually doing pretty good for us. Um, you know, so every once in a while, but I would say I've definitely killed more than what I kept alive. Um, what was the bird? Oh, for, for, from a world perspective? Life oh, lives. life, my life list. My life list is not that great. I think it's probably around last count. It was getting close to 3000 species of birds. And there's around close to four, just close to 9,000 in the world. Okay, and I'm getting close to 3,000, so maybe almost a third. But I've never birded in uh, Asia, so that's a complete, like all my birding trips are mostly Central and South America. I've managed to get to Europe. Uh, I've covered most of the birds in Europe, and I've gotten as far as South Africa um, and New Zealand. But uh, I've never gotten to like India, China. I mean, my God, there's thousands and thousands of species of birds there, uh, which are, remain to be seen <laughs> at some point in the future. Uh, would you be able to speak on the invasiveness of marsh marigold in this area? I wouldn't think that marsh marigold would be invasive. Is it? Oh, you don't know. I don't know. It, we're asking. It won't grow here. No, I was going to think that it would probably be too warm. A lot of people confuse it with ranunculus ficaria or ficaria That is invasive. That's what they think. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, the Ficaria is only a small, small little relative, but it does look like a little miniature marsh marigold. Marsh marigold in itself, like I said, I suspect, and, and Tony's confirmed that it's probably just way too hot here to keep that happy. Um, <clears throat> in the New England states, easy peasy, it'll self-seed, any kind of damp areas in your garden. Um, I know people growing it in Calgary, they're growing it everywhere in Europe. Um, but it's it's as much as it's a whole Arctic plant, it's a northern whole Arctic plant, okay? So it doesn't it really extend into um, warmer climates. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you.